Hey everybody, it's Dave Spector here and we're uh, kicking off our first Zoom podcast interview in the new Shelter in Place Blues from the Inside In series and very excited to welcome as my, my special guest, a great musician, a great guitarist, harmonica player, mandolin player. It's been a fixture on the Chicago blues scene for decades. Say hey to Billy Flynn. Hey, Billy. Hey, Dave. Thanks for, for having me today. Hey, it's great. It's, you know, you were my first guest on my Adventures in Guitar series probably about 12 years ago, and you're my first guest on my first Zoom podcast. So I appreciate you, man. History making time. Yeah. Hey, how have you been uh, dealing with this this terrible situation and lack of gigs and lack of tours? Well, at first, you know, it was the, it was the usual, you know, disappointment and uh, to, to know that all the work that we did was, uh, was we lost our momentum with this, but um, as it became more apparent, the name of the game was just to, you know, to survive and to be with my family and make sure they're okay. Um, that's uh, that's the name of the game for me right now, and um, doing a lot of writing and um, and uh, working on my music and just basically uh, uh, doing a lot of playing on my guitar. That's great. That's great. Yeah, it's tough times in the music business for sure, as well as everything else. But uh, glad to hear you're doing well. Thank you. And. Um, you know, I kind of just wanted to start at the beginning. Um, if you could just tell us about your early days playing music um, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where you're from, and maybe some of the first uh, experiences you had uh, hearing blues on record and hearing blues live. Yeah. Well, you know, wasn't uh, wasn't easy. Um, you know, finding finding the music for me, being uh, the location I was in. But um, I ever since I was a little. You know, it's what what even my mother told me stories about. You know how I would um, when I would she'd be pushing me in a stroller through a store, and I would just grab the guitars off the the toy guitars off the shelf. And wow. uh, basically, that's how I learned. You know how to play because um, even even you know like the first time I ever heard a band live a live guitar, I remember the song was called Gloria. And all the thing that was just running through my head was that da 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 da. da. So I, I took my took out my Mickey Mouse guitar and I learned how to play that. And eventually, uh, when I went to school, they had a thing called an auto harp. And I and I would ask you know the music teacher about notes and stuff like that. And I started putting two to two together. What you know how the notes came together. And uh, and and but really at the same time I was a drummer too. Because that was my first really love was the was the drums. I drove my parents crazy with. Uh, before I got drums, it would be all over the table, uh, the the kitchen table, or in a car. I'd be beating on stuff with my hands, you know, because I love drums so much. But um, with the guitar, you know, I had a I met a guy. Um, you know, I was always interested, and of course, you know, I loved Elvis and the Ventures and stuff like that. And uh, but. Um, my, I met this guy with, that had a guitar, and, and I, I said, could you teach me how to play a bar chord? His name is Eddie, Eddie Beeble, and he's a really a great musician to this day. He uh, played with Wayne Train Hancock, and we're good friends, but he taught me how to play a bar chord. And once I learned a bar chord, I was off. You know, I, uh, wow. you know, I went and uh, I got, a, got an acoustic guitar when I was in sixth grade. I... I paid uh, $10 for it. I put a dollar down, took my bike, rode about five miles, picked it up at a, at a warehouse. And uh, after that, I got my first electric guitar, which was a copy. It was a big hollow body guitar because I saw pictures of West Montgomery in uh, Newsweek magazine. And I, I said, that's, that's the guitar I wanted. So I was at a music store and they had a guitar there and it looked just like that. It turns out it's, it was a Japanese copy, a Conrad it was called. And I uh -huh. still have it, I still love the guitar. But it was a copy of the guitar that uh, Wes Montgomery had. And um, I just took it from there. And uh, that around that same time, you know, Woolworths in, uh, in Green Bay 
I always figure that chess records, they had a, just an immediate place to get rid of a lot of their records was through Woolworths. So I got uh, Muddy Waters, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, and uh, tons of the Ventures, uh, which I loved. And uh, Sandy Nelson, he was a drummer, which had a lot of great musicians on his record. And I, I just uh, basically played along with the, with the records and, you know, that's how I, that was my beginning. Wow. Do you remember how much those uh, those chess records cost at Woolworths back in the day? Oh, sure. Sure. I, I, some of them still have the sticker. They were three for 99 cents. Oh, my Matter God. Matter of fact, we would, we would do our paper. Um, I had a paper route, and also we shoveled snow and cut lawns and stuff to, uh, to make money. And all the time when we were uh, doing this stuff, that's all we would think about, me and my brother, about what albums we were going to go back to get, because we would get like three at a time. And those were new LPs or 45s? They were brand new. They were, they, that was the, the beginning of the cutouts where they would punch a hole in it. And, uh, you know, they, they, the LPs they couldn't sell. I remember one was called the Super Blues Band. And that was the first time I ever heard Little Walter play harmonica was on the Super Blues Band. And uh, it was Bo Diddley, Muddy Waters, and yep. Little Walter. Those yeah, were the kind of records. They just wow. dumped ones that they didn't sell, you know. Unbelievable. Um, when did you first start playing blues? Um, well, you know, it's funny because, you know, I, I, I think um, a lot about what, what I thought blues was. And I, that was kind of mixed up in my mind, you know, because I, I had seen um, Jailhouse Rock, the movie. And um, I mean, I pieced this together later. And there was a few like things in there that were like super bluesy. I mean, very, very much like blues. And I started hearing that, and I was thinking more like Count Basie. That's what blues was. So I'm just a general term, you know, like a big band with yeah. uh, some really cool um, drumming, you know, with the kicks and uh, just this really exciting 12-bar music like that. And, um, you know, I thought that was what it was. But then I'm more I, I heard those chess records, I, I, I got where the guitar came into it, you know, and... Uh, but that was really my, my introduction to the, you know, a lot of like, like the music that Alfred Hitchcock would have or the Twilight Zone when they would go into a bar and they would play yeah. the jukebox. It was always yeah. something kind of bluesy. So that kind of threw me off. But there was a record that Chuck Berry did called Deep Feeling, which was on uh, his first album. It was a, basically where he played steel on it. Well, it turns out, I think it's Hubert Sumlin that plays the second guitar on it, but it's uh basically a Jimmy Reed type of pattern. And uh, I remember playing that over and over and over because I just love to just do those two notes like Jimmy Reed things. They call it the lump now, but, you know, that, that was my introduction to what I, you know, really think now of as the blues sound, especially Chicago blues. Sure. Wow, that's great. Can you remember um, some of the first blues you ever heard in a live setting? Oh, sure. I definitely can remember that. Um, there was a club here in, uh, in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, which was called the Clark Kent Super Joint, which was uh, booked by Tom Radi. Sure. And he uh, represented Johnny Young and uh, Jimmy Rogers and uh, Johnny Little John. And a uh, matter of fact, Jimmy Rogers had just come out of retirement uh, around this time. And the first, uh, the first week the club was open, I, I, I saw Jimmy Dawkins in uh, Big Voice Odom. And uh, Jimmy was extremely encouraging to me. And uh, that was the, really the beginning of um, where I said, this, I love this music and this is what I want to do. You know, I didn't really think about it. I just did it. But um, yeah. that was the first real live blues that I saw. And how old were you then, Billy? I was 14. 14. Yeah, I was actually, I couldn't get into the club because uh, it was 21 at the time to get in because there were actually 18, it turned 18 shortly after that. But um, I couldn't get into the place, so uh, Jimmy's drummer came out and he saw me out there with my SG. I just bought it. And uh, I was playing along with um, uh, Why is Sing the Blues by B.B. King was on a jukebox and he heard me play and he went in and got Jimmy and said, Hey, there's this kid outside. He's got a guitar. You know, should we have him come in? And Jimmy came out and he started asking me questions. And uh, and and he talked to the club owner and he said, "Well, come on in. We're going to have a jam." And uh, that was wow. kind of the beginning of that with him. But the next week after that was uh, Johnny Little John, 
yeah. who I was extremely familiar with because we, uh, at the time, had this record called uh, Johnny Little John's Blues All Stars, which is a really a great, great album. And um, and he was uh, Jimmy Rogers was there, but his name wasn't even on the bill because Jimmy had just recently come out of retirement, and uh, Johnny and Jimmy were living together at the time. They were playing with Bob Reedy. And um, so that was the second week of this uh, thing of, of meeting these guys. And uh, when I saw Jimmy Rogers do Sloppy Drunk, I just, I mean, when I saw that voice, you know, the come out of these speakers and live, yeah. I mean, I, and it was just, it was so different than, like, say, um, the music that was going on at the time, the blues rock music, which sure. was, you know, I had a passing interest in it. But once I heard that at 14 years old, you know, Johnny Little John playing slide or uh, Jimmy Dawkins playing a Jaguar, you know, um, that was, yeah. um, that kind of changed my whole thing. That's amazing that at 14, you were a pretty cool 14 year old. You already knew about Johnny Little John and you already knew about Jimmy Rogers. And, you know, that's yeah, remarkable. Uh, Real fortunate that I, uh, you know, I, I always just followed my spirit. You know, whatever, whatever I yeah. was into, I would, I would search right. it out. It was always hard to find, but you know, it was worth finding. Yeah, and it's also, it's also fascinating that the first live blues you saw was Jimmy Dawkins, and I know he's really still is one of your all-time heroes. Yes, uh, blues guitar. Talk a little about Jimmy's style and his his attack and and technique. It's so different and so unique. Yeah, well, um, Jimmy, when I when I first saw him at Clark Kent Superjoint, he was playing the Jaguar, you know, the solid body guitar. Later, he was known for playing the big uh, uh, three fifty five Gibson right. uh, stereo. But at the time, he was playing this uh, Jaguar, which really caught my attention. And uh, he had a a guy named Detroit Jr. playing uh, organ for him. Uh, he had a box uh, Jaguar organ. So the music that they were playing, to me, what I remember it sounded like was very much like early, what would be called early funk music. It was mm -hmm. like a boogaloo beat, you know, yeah. kind of like in a way, um, I can't think of a song right now, but, you know, just something with that, like, uh, you know, like what was going on at the time. And Jimmy had a lot of reverb. And he used tremolo on his, so his style was a little bit different at, at the beginning. It was a real reflection of the uh, of the times, this, the, the real 60s sound to it. And um, after that, uh, you've changed. Matter of fact, when, when, when we first met, Jimmy had the Jaguar and I had the Gibson. He asked me about the Gibson. He said, how do you like Gibson? I said, oh man, I love the Gibsons. And he says, I want to get one, you know. And then at, right after that, he ended up getting one. And uh, I was just glad that I could see him actually playing the Jaguar because that was, it was yeah. pretty amazing. I know that you are a lover of the uh, offset Fender guitars also, you know, and they're really uh, unusual. Yeah. Just, uh, just one thing, put the, uh, the, the time frame into context. What year was the, the Jimmy Dawkins gig that you first saw it? Uh, it was in August of, of 1970. Okay, 1970. Yeah. And I'm also a huge fan, and I got to work with um, Big Voice Odom, also known as B.B. Odom. Right. And I know he, he and Jimmy Dawkins had a long partnership together. Yeah. Um, could you talk about him? Oh, sure. Because uh, at the time, I had a, a, this, he was a, a friend of mine. He was a pool hustler, and he called himself my manager, right? And uh, he was the guy that actually did a lot of talking to get me uh, into the place and, uh, and kind of encouraged me to come there, too. And, uh, and he, he became real talkative to Big Voice Odom, and they were talking. And, he, and he, after I played, he said, I want to get that boy to come to Chicago to record with me. And, you know, I mean, if that would be now, well, that wouldn't be any problem. But I was 14 years old. I mean, I, I had no idea how to pursue it. But just the just the, the fact that he asked me to, you know, to yeah, do it. That was amazing. really exciting. It was, it was like, the, it was a step to me in the right direction. It was like, was well, my very, my first step to get to Chicago. Yeah. When did you, when did you, when did you eventually get to Chicago? Well, uh, that was around 78. 
around 77, 78, because my brother, um, he's a year older than I am. He was, uh, he was working in Chicago and uh, we would, we'd go out to the clubs and stuff. Uh, just to back up a little bit about Big Voice Odom too, is that what, what, what I really remember about him mostly that uh, just, I mean, other than sounding like B.B. King and just totally blowing our minds was that uh, the mic cord that he had was really shorted. So it was like, you know how those old mics, you see them taped up, you know, and stuff. Yeah. It was, it was, it, it, the mic kept cutting out, but it, it never like affected him where he would like notice that it didn't. He was just so in the zone, you know, and at the time I, you know, it was just like, this guy is just really into it. I mean, it's just, you know, it was yeah. amazing how powerful he was. He didn't really need the mic. Exactly. That's what I say about Johnny Littlejohn, too. He had such a powerful voice. I, re I remember seeing him at Roses, and um, he didn't need a mic. You know, his no. voice was so big and so, right. you know, just carried so well. Yeah, yeah. A big voice. That was that got away, you know, Johnny Little John, you know, like, I mean, he could have been as big as Muddy and his, you know, I mean, and when it really the, uh, the time frame, you know, when he was born and, and his, his whole story is, you know, very similar to that. Yeah. Yeah, talk about some of the other unsung heroes of Chicago blues guitar. And I know you got to play with people like Little Smokey Smothers and, and Otis yeah. Rush, of course. Um, yeah. But uh, talk about some players and maybe recommend some players to our listeners mm -hmm. that um, the general blues audience might not be familiar with. Yeah, well, Little Sm well, when I think of Little Smokey and, um, and both James Wheeler, two mm -hmm. guitar players that just were just, you know, like – they just had beautiful tone and that they were just such um, mature players, you know, and when I would be on stage with them, I had to come up with something, you know, I mean, I had to sound good. So I learned a lot playing next to those guys about, um, about tone and about, um, about fitting in, you know, like as another guitar player. And uh, so I would, I would definitely, um, you know, like uh, recommend finding anything you can with Little Smokey on it. Um, he hasn't. He didn't really record a lot, and also James Wheeler didn't record a lot. Both both of those guys, but they're definitely worth checking out for. You know, as far as some of the newer ones, um, there's a guy you now going back years ago. Unfortunately, I never got to meet him, but um, his name was uh, Lefty Guitar Bates. And mm -hmm. he was really great. If you, anybody out there can find it, I think it's called Rock Alley. If you can find a 45 called Rock Alley by Lefty Bates. Lefty Bates was an unsung hero of, uh, of Chicago music, not just blues, but he was also a great jazz player. And he, um, I, I, I see some similarities in the way he played blues in some, some respects to uh, Otis Rush without the, you know, the heavy emotional content, but just those stinging of his notes and uh, maybe being a left-handed also. Interesting. Yeah, just so our listeners know, when they, if you're not familiar with Smokey Smothers and you go to look him up, Little Smokey had a brother, Otis, who was known as Big Smokey, and their styles were completely different. Right. Um, and I'm sure you, you, you knew and got to play with Big Smokey as well. So yeah. talk for a minute about, about that that just that difference between the two that was so yeah. special. Well, you know, like little Smokey told me, you know, we, we, we got to be really good friends. We would, uh, we would drink Miller light and, uh, and play uh, guitars all day when we weren't, uh, you know, just uh, playing or, you know, in the van, we'd always get, you know, get to the room and we just, you know, play our guitars and stuff. But Smokey told me that, um, that, that he really wanted to play jazz. And I think, you know, what, what, by, by saying that it more like Kenny Burrell, uh, you yeah. know, that style of, uh, of Grant Green of, of guitar, he really liked that Chitlin's and Carney and, you know, sure. stuff like this. And, uh, so his uh, thing was more Albert King and, and a little jazzier sound where, uh, he had a lot of skill and he went to, went to, uh, went to a music school, you know, to learn how to play guitar. And, um, his brother was more like a self-taught genius, I guess you could say, because his, his lyrics, nobody could come up with like lyrics what that man did. I mean, he was brilliant in, yeah. in a way, kind of like Jimmy Reed was. I think he was a lot like Jimmy Reed, actually, you know, like a real gut bucket uh, blues, but 
elegant in a way that, you know, um, his lyrics were the shining, you know, part of that. And yeah. just interesting songwriter. Right. And Big Smokey recorded for Federal, didn't he? Right. Yeah. With Freddie yeah. King. Yeah. And Freddie King on second guitar. Yeah, that's so that's amazing. Did you ever yeah. see Freddie, Billy? Did you ever see I Freddie? I never saw Freddie King. No, I never did. I Jimmy Dawkins would tell me you know, stories about him, like when he would break a string that he could actually, when he was singing, he could take a string and somehow tie it together and tune it back up and make it work. Oh, you know, my that's God. a legend. Yeah. That's a legend. <laughs> so kind, kind of take us um, through your, we, were, we left off, I think, in the late 70s. Talk about some of the other uh, important gigs you had um, with Chicago blues players and also maybe with some Wisconsin-based blues players. Okay. Well, um, I would say that, um, you know, when I started, like when I finished school, um, that's when I started playing with Jimmy Dawkins. That's when we, we connected again. And um, I played on and off with him until – Till the almost the end for him, I think it was his last gig. Was with me at Smoke Daddy uh, during the Blues Fest. Uh, the last year he was alive, I think it was 2013. And um, uh, at the at the same time, I was playing with um, the legendary blues band. That was a that was a big uh, breakthrough for me. Was with the legendary blues band and uh, recording with them and and doing a lot of traveling with them. And man, I wish I could think of a lot of the people. Um, Dietra Farr, I mean, I played sure. with Dietra Farr in uh, Mississippi Heat uh, yeah. for, for a while. Um, I played with Otis Rush for a while. That was yeah. in, the, in the later 90s. Uh, okay. I was doing some uh, work also with uh, John Brim, the Ice Cream Man, which was uh, another one. He was the, we were, I was together with him for his last gig, too, in, uh, at the Soup Kitchen. Oh, yeah, in Detroit. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, not the soup kitchen, but BB Soups and Blues, different soup restaurant. Oh, okay. Uh, Soups and Blues in St. Louis, yeah. Now, let me just interrupt for a sec. The legendary blues band, um, when they originally started, was um, Willie Big Eye Smith, Calvin Jones, Pine Top, as the key members of Muddy Waters Band, Jerry Portnoy. Um, right. When you were in Legendary, talk about the personnel. Well, when I joined the uh, when I joined the legendary blues band, it was Daryl Davis had taken the place of, of Pine Top Perkins at that time. Okay, and um, it was Calvin and Willie yeah. on bass and drums, and it was Jerry Portnoy on harmonica. And um, Jerry left the band. And Willie became the band leader, and uh, we brought in um, Little Smokey Smothers instead of uh, Daryl. Uh -huh. on and uh, and after Jerry left, it was Madison Slim also on harmonica. Oh right, that, right. It, it didn't seem like that lasted very long for me. You know, uh, it was kind of like the was working his way where Willie chose to uh, to to get up in front and play harmonica at that time. Got it. Yeah, I was in that band for a short stint in 1989, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um. It was uh, John Dewich and myself were on guitar with Willie and yeah. Fuzz. Yeah. But uh, they really weren't working a lot back then. Yeah. But what a rhythm section, needless yeah. to say. A, a small handful of some of your biggest influences. Well, I think that um, obviously, like, I would start it, you know, and how I found out about them was first Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry is like my number one, you know, uh, I idolize the guy. And um, his, um, his, his music was so different because it wasn't just blues. It was, he was singing in different languages and, you know, just the, but the whole guitar thing got me so started, you know, it turned me on to different people because he, uh, in an interview said um, that he liked Charlie Christian and Elmore James, Elmo James. And I'm like, those are two two names I remembered, and I and I found records by them, and I went, wow, yeah. just that alone is. If you would have just told me, that would have been heavy. But BB yeah. King would be after that. BB uh, was uh, um, on on the television all the time on on Johnny Carson show and Flip mm -hmm. Wilson show, and uh, he was all over the place. And really, the first real blues record I ever bought was The Thrill Is Gone. 
you know, it was a 45 on Blues Way. And still to this day, it was one of my favorite songs. I love this song. I never get sick of yeah. it. And, uh, but, but that's uh, Chuck Berry, B.B. King. Um, and I, I definitely have to say Jimmy Rogers is in there. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and as far as slide playing, obviously all the, the, the Johnny Little John and Elmore James would be number one for me. You know, um, Hound Dog Taylor. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the other style of slide, it would be um, Earl Hooker. <clears throat> sure. And uh, Robert Nighthawk. Those two guys blew my mind, you know, yeah. the, and Tampa Red, all three of them in the line created a, created what we kind of know as slide. Right. Is it true that Tampa Red taught Robert Nighthawk? Or I think he, I think he influenced them big time because yeah. you know, my, my gauge of how if somebody influenced somebody is if they do their songs. Yes. You know, and he does all his, you know, like, I mean, um, this song he did, I'm not much to look at and I don't pretend to be. You know, that's a, that's an old Tampa Red song, you know, uh, mm -hmm. even Anna Lou and it turned into Anna Lee, you know, so there was a lot of, there was a lot of, a um, lot of influence there. And it's interesting, you look at Tampa Red, he was the blueprint, then Robert Nighthawk came on and he put his heavy, heavy, yeah. deep, um, toned guitar on it. And then a guy named Earl Hooker came along and he heard Robert Nighthawk. And 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 Robert and uh, Earl Hooker had such a brilliant, clean, clean reverb kind of sound, and he put a sparkle on it. So you can see the line of of uh, of change. Yeah, yeah. Talk about Jimmy Rogers for a moment, because Jimmy's style is not going to hit you over the head with heavy bends and and flash. It's it's beautifully subtle, yeah. and and um, understated. And um, talk about his style, his role, and of course the classic Muddy Waters bands in the '50s, and then his his uh, legendary solo recordings on chess. Well, Jimmy, no, when Jimmy started off, he was playing mostly uh, by himself or with Little Walter, or you know, with Muddy, maybe just two or three pieces. So he would be playing the bass lead, and kind of like what I was talking about before, more of the solo approach, and. Um, to know that style is to know that the B.B. King single string style was relatively a new, like when Eric Clapton came out with that, that was around the time, really not too much further than when I first started getting into blues. So that whole style of, of the guitar soaring and taking off as a solo instrument, really B.B. King, I think, is the one that, that really did that you know that, mm -hmm. that brought it to that to that level yeah yeah i think i think t-bone did as well but on uh, on a more yeah. sub level yeah you know? yeah yeah bb i think brought the range into it t-bone all stayed you know because back then they had the arch top guitars that didn't have the range so yes. when he came out he not only did what t-bone did up here but he moved it all over and added yeah. his own thing to it also yeah but uh, getting back to jimmy rogers he was more of a of a finger picker and uh, you know like um, something like see that's more the so Billy I wanted to put a little plug in for a project that we're both working on during the uh, shelter at home uh, lockdown so to speak and that's we're both teaching. Um, video lessons um and folks can check it out if they go to at home chicago blues.com again that's at home chicago blues.com and you can check out our uh, our video lessons and billy really excited to have you uh teaching and uh appreciate you spending the time on the lessons i know you've been working on them yeah, yeah, it's really exciting um, what what they're doing. What we what we did um, the last couple of years has been uh, been a lot of fun. Yeah, this is part of the Chicago Blues Camp, Chicago Blues Boot Camp, and we were scheduled to be at the Chicago Blues Festival um, and a number of other festivals later this year and next year. Hopefully, when things get back to normal, teaching people who come in. Uh, to watch the blues festivals and then learn. I need my evening coffee. Um, here we go. 
So, Billy, one of the collaborations that you're most famous for is working with Kim Wilson over the last number of years um, in the studio on the road. Um, I know you guys worked on the Cadillac Records movie soundtrack, which won a Grammy Award. So tell us um, just kind of briefly how the collaboration with Kim started and and where it's at now. Well, um, it started, uh, I would believe, when I was with the legendary blues band was when I first met Kim was right around the time before Tough Enough took off. You know, it was like, I remember him saying, you know, we got something, you know, it's going to be big, you know, right now. So it was right a little bit before all that happened. And um, we just naturally just hit it off. I think the first night that that we met, we stayed up, and me and Calvin and uh, and Kim stayed up all night long just playing, um, just playing old blues and stuff and having a great time. And then uh, later, uh, when he did a recording um, in the year 2000, um, in Phoenix, uh, he asked me to be part of it, and after that, it just really blossomed our uh, relationship uh, that that we have as friends and um, and as uh, musicians. It really uh, blossomed a lot after after that recording. Uh, that was actually the uh, beginning of the Grammy uh, nomination for me too. That uh, live at. Uh, at, uh, it was called Smoke and Joint. Is uh, was nominated for a Grammy, which is really no words can explain how excited we were that that happened. You know, at that time. Yeah, I bet. I bet. And talk about the uh, the Cadillac Records project. Yeah. What was it like doing a, a movie soundtrack? Well, to work with uh, with with Steve was in, incredible. Uh, the producer, um, Steve Jordan. He, um, I, I love the way he worked because we went in and uh, we did like, you know, you have a whole week to do the whole, you know, soundtrack for us planned. And I think that we ended up doing a majority of it in just hours. We just were having such a great time and I just watched him work and it was just the average person would say, oh, well, we, we got this done today. This is great. We're going to quit. But Steve just let it kept going and going. And I liked the way he worked, you know, and, um, you know, and the interesting thing was too, is that when they send me a, a CD to learn the material for the, uh, for the, for the uh, soundtrack and the material that they were going to do, I noticed that there was also, um, cause they wanted me to do the Chuck Berry and Muddy Waters, but <clears throat> I also know that there was the Eddie James stuff was on there too. So I thought, well, I'm going to be prepared for this. And we're talking like ballads that were in F sharp, you know, and uh, many, many chord changes and things I had to, uh, you know, work on. So I took two weeks and I just every day would work on these uh, Etta James songs, which I didn't, I wasn't familiar. I, I knew the role with me, Henry, uh, Etta James, you know, back from Johnny Otis days, but I wasn't familiar with the chess, you know, um, you know, Eddie James, a more modern version of it. So I really uh, went to work on that and and was uh, really prepared for it. And uh, well, it turned out that was the that was the part that actually turned out to be the part that won the Grammy because uh, at last was uh, was uh, it won the R and B single of the year, which is where the where the Grammy winning came in. Wow! Yeah, and. Uh, it, it was a lot of work for me to do that, but I, um, like we had talked about, I really don't read music. I, I'm self-taught, so yeah. I had to write out my own maps. I call them maps, you know. <laughs> this is not even music, but I, so I could understand it. Were you the only guitar player on? No, uh, no. Um, we had um, um, also <laughs> Eddie Taylor Jr. He played mostly rhythm, and then there was another Danny Kirchner. I think is how you say it, Danny Kirchmar. Yes, that's it. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't pronounce his sure. name right. But, uh, yeah, he was also playing rhythm. And uh, Larry Taylor was on bass, Steve on drums, Kim. Yeah, Danny Korchmar is a kind of an L.A. studio legend, played on uh, a lot of those early Jackson Brown records. Yeah. And 
so many other records. That's great. So, so you learned some R and B, and then which Muddy and Chuck Berry tunes did you play on on the soundtrack? Um, well, all of them. All of them. Uh, yeah, all of them. Actually, I played lead on all of it because uh, what really what uh, what got Steve's attention. From, Kim had recommended me for this. And he said, well, I got a guy that can do uh, Chuck Berry because uh, one time we were playing uh, with Kim and somebody yelled out, do some Chuck Berry. Well, we did it and, and the place just went crazy. And Kim went, yeah. okay, this guy, this guy can play Chuck Berry. Okay, so after that, we started doing more Chuck Berry. And then that's when, that's when uh, I got the call from Kim. He said, he's telling me about the project. And and uh, he said, you know, I recommend you because you could do the, uh, um, the the both the muddy waters and the and the style of uh, Chuck Berry. But it turns out too that there was a little more to it than that because I actually did a couple of songs that I wrote in the movie too. Uh, some of the pieces uh, that were um, a more of a soundscape, which is really exciting for me because. But I'm not just about blues. I'm just about music. I like I like music. I mean everything from somewhere over to the rainbow to uh, never been like a big rock guy. So I think I like I like melodies a lot. I, and I love funk music. Uh, back when I first was playing back in the Clark Kent days, a uh, little bit after that, uh, I couldn't find anybody to play blues with where I lived. So um, they were all into Stanley Turrentine and uh, the Crusaders. Yeah, and everything George Benson. I mean, so that that was that was a whole chapter for me. I had to learn all this stuff, and uh, my mind, you know, just definitely never left that. Uh, I I love that that kind of music. So um, yeah, I was just listening to your uh, your Lonesome Highway record on Delmark, and there's a great version of the In Crowd by Ramsey Lewis on it, which I really enjoyed. Thank you. Hey, let's um in. Uh, in honor of all the guitar geeks out there that are watching and listening, let's talk gear for a minute. I see some cool guitars behind you. Um, tell us what you got back there. Well, most of my guitars are uh, are Jay Terser guitars, which is um, you know when I when I first heard about them, my my friend who had a music store was telling me about these guitars and how great they were, and I was just, you know just wanted to play it. But then when I when I play when I I just realized that. How much I liked them because they they just seem to feel so good to me. They're real light, you know, mm -hmm. sturdy but light, and and the necks are nice and trim, not where you have to have your hand open real wide. It's just a nice a nice grip, very friendly feeling to me. So um, I have a like a Stratocaster. Uh, these are all the J Terser copies. I have a Stratocaster, Telecaster, a Mustang copy. A 175, a Les Paul, you know, just uh, just about everything that you could imagine. A, a nice resonator for playing oh, slide on. Yeah. yeah, but 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 the thing is, is that like I, I told you about the the copy that I got on my, my first electric guitar was a Conrad copy of a jazz guitar. So I kind of like way back then was even even into the like uh, just I just didn't want to have what everybody else had. I just wanted to have something a little bit different. Interesting. And these, these guitars are really unique. But when I was in like when I was in school, I was playing in a lot of bands, you know, like top forty bands and country bands and you know different uh, you know gigging bands. So I had a lot of uh, guitars that I bought. I had a three fifty five stereo, which uh, which ended up uh, I ended up selling to uh, Jimmy Dawkins. And uh, if you ever saw Hip Link Chain's record, well, that's my three fifty five on the cover. That's where that ended up with him. But I had a, um, I had a bunch of different 335s at the time, too. So, I mean, I had a lot of really good guitars, but um, the ones that I cling to are just ones that I really like. And I was like, I don't want to be, you know, just to, like, you know, just because it says one name on it, I like it more yeah. than another one. Yeah. But, uh, I really enjoy these guitars a lot. And, and talk about some of uh, your favorite amps both in the studio and uh, live? Well, um, when I, 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 I used my Super Reverb, that was the amp that I fell in love with for, for a long time. I have two of them, two Blackface Super Reverbs, uh, about mid-60s. 
And uh, those amps just got used and used and used. And, uh, you know, the tubes started falling out of it and just couldn't rely on them, you know, to be my main amps. And I sat in with, um, with Jimmy Rogers one time. And Jimmy had a PV. And, and immediately I just, I love the way the bass string sounded. So I just went, you know, I'm going to try a PV. And I, and I got a PV. And ever since then, that's been my amp that I like the most. Um, probably the, in a, in a, for concerts and, and, and things like that, the bigger venues, I love a twin reverb. I think, yeah. you know, that's, that's my, my favorite, you know, of that. But for recording, I like, I like experimenting in the studio you know, with with different uh, smaller amplifiers, you know, sometimes they have at the studios. I think it, that can be really cool. When you were replicating Chuck Berry and Muddy Waters and and the sound of Chess Records on the Cadillac Records soundtrack, were you able to use instruments from that era, or did you just yeah. use your own stuff? I had, I had, believe it or not, I had my own guitar tech, <laughs> and he would come in. And um, matter of fact, one of the, if you listen to the Cadillac soundtrack, um, you'll hear that there's a Beach Boys number in there because Chuck Berry covered the uh, one of the Beach Boys tunes, so they wanted to have that uh, that that rendition in there. So he said, "Tomorrow we're doing surf music," and I said, "Okay, no problem." And yeah. uh, and and I said I'll need a '64 Jaguar and a deluxe reverb. Make sure the reverb works. Yes. And, uh, so with the Chuck Berry, I used a. Um, it's like a gold top. What is it? What is that? A two ninety five, I think. Do you, are you familiar with the two ninety five? The two ninety five one seventy five. Yeah. Like the Chuck Berry had. Yeah, that's what I used for the early Chuck Berry stuff. Oh wow, a two ninety five. Those are great. Yeah, it's, it really, he took the guy that, that uh, he said Bob Dylan really wanted to buy that guitar from him, but he said, no, nah, I'm not going to sell this one because too many people have played it, you know, and it was a beautiful yeah. guitar. They, hey, man, they Bob put, wouldn't have played it right anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, he does his thing, you know? Yeah, I know. Um, hey, any younger players on the scene that, that, you, that you like or are excited about that are kind of, playing things right, carrying on the tradition or, 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 you know, inventing their own thing. Yeah. Well, there's a guy that I, that I work with in uh, Cashbox Kings. I think he's extremely talented. He's uh, he's 18 years old. I call him Zabi, Zabi do, but his name is Xavier. And uh, he's a marvelous guitar player. He uh, took some lessons from some, uh, from gospel guitar players in Milwaukee. And I, I, I really like him a lot. And, uh -huh. um, uh, well, of course, Little Frank. I always, I, I think, Little Frank Krakowski is a is a great guitar player too. He's getting old though. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're all, you know, we're all getting there. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, any um, any plans for a follow up to the Lonesome Highway record, or any new recording plans with anyone else? Well, my um, right now, you know, things are kind of on hold, but I'm I'm writing a lot. I'm I'm I just wrote five songs for Bob Stroger. Oh wow! I wrote some songs for also for uh, Oscar Wilson that uh, for uh, future future projects for uh, Cashbox Kings and uh, maybe solo. Um, and my own material, um, you know, I'm still I still am writing a lot of songs every day. Um, I, I yeah. discovered on my cell phone a thing called voice me uh, voice memos, which has become my sure. new sets. So I just uh, I loop uh, some tracks and I I play along with them. And um, I'm doing a lot of uh, you know um, like like my uh, my things that I always wanted to learn. You know, songs that I always wanted to learn. I'm I have a list and I'm just going through the list every night. I uh, you know, like ballads, old ballads like Cottage for Sale. And um, yeah, um, there's a song called Deed I Do, an old gospel song. I, all these songs that I, whenever I think of them, I write them down and, I, and I'm learning them. That's great. Any advice for aspiring blues players who uh, want to be like Billy Flynn? Well, I wouldn't think that would be such a great idea. <laughs> but um, I was, I was, I, th I think that um, the one thing about blues guitar is that to me, and my take on it is that I think a lot of the, the things are overlooked. 
the things that are might you might go well that's just a, that's just so easy that that people overlook it and they they try to do more than what they uh, actually need to um, you know to get a to get a real handle you know for the sound of it so I would say that and um, you know like like what I was going to say before is like when I asked Eddie Taylor if I could use his guitar one time at a jam session. He was very nice to me. So I always remember that that all of my musician friends that I've been encountered, they were some of the most helpful people. You know, yeah. so I would say that anybody that you see that you like and you know, that you see it could be with any band that you like, not blues, but but go go look after them, you know, stay after the show when you see them walking out with a guitar case make a connection with them, ask them questions, you know, that's, that's what I did. You know, I, I would say, well, I found out this is an A. Well, I know the ABC, so I went A, B, C. I figured out what the notes are. And then I go to, I would say to somebody, how come there's a, you know, what's this note in between A and B, you know, and, and just ask questions, you know, to learn. Yeah. yeah. Great. Good advice, and thanks for mentioning Hip Link Chain, by the way. Speaking of unsung heroes of blues yeah. guitar, Hip was my friend, and I used to love going to hear him. There's some great videos, a couple great live videos of him on YouTube, if you want to check out, or a true original, check out Hip Link Chain. Hip I think Link he has, what, at least a couple records out, right, Billy? Yeah, yeah, he does. There's, there, there's actually some really good um, uh, uh, YouTubes of him at home. I think there's one where... He's playing, I think the, the man is from France. He came and uh, he's a great guitar player also. Yeah. So they're playing together on the video. But also in that same vein, we can't forget Mighty Joe Young and Luther Allison. Yeah. Well, Luther Allison, I mean, he asked me to play with him twice. Unfortunately, the timing wasn't great. I never did get to play with him. But from day one, he was an inspiration, you know, just from the time I met Jimmy Dawkins at that same time. Luther Allison, I think, was to me was just um, he just was such a soulful musician and uh, such an incredible you know performer. And Mighty Joe Young, his uh, his playing, his lead solos, everything, but his rhythm playing also is you know, behind Magic Sam. I mean, yeah, God, that is just just such great work. Yeah. Yeah, I only got to play with Mighty Joe once. It was actually at, at the Chicago Blues Fest in '93, but he, uh, I think he had had a stroke and wasn't able to play guitar anymore. Yeah, that's a, that was a real shame. Yeah, but he uh -huh. still was was a great singer. So, Billy, if people want to find out more about you, uh, BillyFlynn.com, I believe, is your website. Yeah. I would just, you know, like I'm, I'm pretty much, um, you know, keep things pretty simple. I would just Google Billy Flynn blues guitar, right? You know, see what you know. There's been a lot of stories and. Uh, and interviews and stuff like that. Um, that I also, uh, you know, the Cash Box Kings. I play with the Cash Box Kings too. So, um, you know, if things ever get to, to where we can play again, yeah, God willing. Yeah. All right, Billy. Well, stay well and keep on playing and writing. And thanks so much for being a guest on uh, Blues from the Inside In. And, and Dave, I always wanted to let you know, too, that I like what you do with your music, too. You, you created a whole style around what you do. I like that a lot with your instrumentals. Oh, thank you, Billy. Take good care, man. Hope to see you soon. All right, Dave. Thank you so much for asking right. me to be a part of it. Thank you.